Hi guys, welcome to my channel. Today we will look at another terrible crime. North Carolina is the motherland of country music, blues, and Cherokee Indians. Nowadays, it is a conservative and prosperous state in the northern part of the South. Unlike South Carolina, there is almost no crime, but if the state is being talked about in the news, it is more often due to snowstorms, tornadoes, and severe thunderstorms. Its tropical storms and floods, wildfires and landslides are a much greater threat than people are. But there's always an exception. On April 10, 2019, a storm was caused by 17-year-old Tristan Borlas. A teenager from a religious family took his parents' lives at the family home in Deep Gap, North Carolina. On Wednesday evening, a girl called the emergency service and reported a large amount of blood in her house and three missing family members, her parents and the younger brother. She added that they also were not answering their phones. The police immediately left for Deep Gap, about a mile from the border of Watauga and Wilkes counties. When officers arrived, they discovered blood on stone steps of the walkway that leads to the house. Blood was also found on the porch and the doormats just before entering the house. Deputies searched the property and discovered Jeffrey Burlace's body under a hammock behind an outbuilding with puncture wounds to the abdomen. He had several stab wounds. A little later, at about 10.30 p.m., they found a pickup truck hidden in the woods with the body of a woman covered with a blanket with bags of mulch piled on top. Jeffrey Borlas, Tristan's father, was born on April 16, 1975, in the family of a pastor of the Conservative Church of the Spiritual Bible Brotherhood, a pietism religious movement. The boy was raised in an atmosphere of constant presence of the strict eye of God. Serious and thorough Bible study and moral edification were the foundation of his education. Any entertainment, even laughter and bright clothes, was forbidden. Good deeds, charity, missionary work, love for an enemy, and refusal of all forms of violence were considered a virtue. Jeffrey learned all these basics as the son of Pastor Harry Borlas. He was a kind, loving, gentle, and patient boy. In his youth, Jeffrey got a summer job at the water park in Missouri. On the first day of work, he met a charming girl named Tanya May Trandum. They were the same age, had the same views and the same upbringing. Tanya, like Jeffrey, grew up in a family where Christian values were important. A patient, humble, selfless girl saw an ideal future husband and caring father in him. She gave Jeffrey a photo of an elderly couple holding hands and said, One day it's going to be us. Jeffrey's mother, Katie Brown, prayed that God would give her son a wife who loved God and her prayers had been answered. The young lovers got married and continued to live according to religious views. That photo was carefully kept in the family album. Later, the young couple had their first child, a charming girl named Taylor. Then three more were born. Tristan was the youngest. Taylor was a real big sister. She took care of everyone, helped and supported her siblings. She was a best friend to her youngest brother. For Tristan, Taylor was the best and only friend. Despite the age difference, they did everything together. They played sports, listened to music, and caused mischief. According to the family religious beliefs, the goal of upbringing is to establish the kingdom of God in a child's heart. When the four children grew up, Jeffrey and Tanya decided to fulfill their Christian duty and adopted four more boys from the orphanage. The open, loving, and friendly family has become even bigger. Now they have eight children, Taylor, twins Kaya and Alexis, Misery, Al, Stephen, Meliku, and Tristan. Children were forbidden to use mobile phones and social networks until a certain age, and asceticism in needs and desires was encouraged. Boys were forbidden to date girls until they graduated from high school, until the age of 18. Bible study was mandatory. Other than that, children grew up like any other normal boys and girls. Their parents did not distinguish between their own children and foster children. They were all given the same attention, care, and affection. There was a harmonious atmosphere in their house. Their mother paid attention to the children and prayed a lot. The couple believed that they themselves must do virtue and set an example for children. When the hurricane hit Haiti, Tanya sold her expensive wedding ring and sent the money to a fund engaged in the construction of housing for the victims. She bought herself a simple cheap ring instead. In 2015, 
Taylor graduated from high school and moved to Boone to attend Appalachian State University. Tristan lost his only friend and was left alone. Taylor came home at the first opportunity, but she had her own life, and Tristan stayed home. Since childhood, he rebelled against restrictions and did not agree with the religious views of his parents. He was annoyed that he couldn't use the phone to communicate with his peers on social media, especially since such communication has become an important part of the modern teenager's life. After Taylor's leave, his arguments with his parents became more frequent. In December 2017, positive changes happened in the family's life. Jeffrey, his wife and children moved into a new house in Deep Gap, Watauga County, North Carolina. The house was located on a dirt road leading into the forest and was much more spacious than the previous one. In addition, the new home was close to Robin's house, Tanya's mother. The close proximity made it possible to ask her for help in looking after the youngest children. We don't know if this move was the same positive change for Tristan because he had to change schools. In Watauga, he went to a local high school and started athletics. Other children got jobs as counselors at summer camps. At first glance, it might seem that everything was fine, but it wasn't. Over time, Tristan's behavior began to cause problems. In 2018, the school insisted that he attend therapy sessions with a psychologist about his anger issues and impulsive behavior. In 2019, despite his excellent abilities, he had difficulties understanding some school subjects, and these problems only increased. From a great student, he turned into an indifferent teenager who lost interest in studying. Tristan began to be late for lessons and did not want to study at all. It got to the point where he put on headphones during class and sat with an absent look. Some teachers tried to help Tristan, and he accepted their help, but it all ended with a lack of interest on his side. He also caused troubles at home. He constantly argued with his parents despite the fact that he was allowed to use a phone. Tristan spent a lot of time on the internet. On his Instagram account, he called himself a musician. Taylor was interested in her siblings' lives and noticed that Tristan argued with his mother on religious topics. She also found out about his other problems at school. She tried to talk to him, but their relationship was no longer trusting. After a while, Tristan became friends with a girl from the religious community, Evelyn Faith Jackson. They started dating without observing the ban on intimate relationships. Sometimes they smoked illegal substances, and Tristan complained about his mother, who discussed his behavior with him at night which made Tristan tired and unable to concentrate at school. The young man was very worried that he had a lot of problems and did not meet his mother's expectations. He said that he could be himself around his father, but not with his mother. On April 10, 2019, many secrets from Tristan's life came out. Surveillance cameras were installed in the barn, and Tristan's old phone, which he sometimes used secretly from his parents, was used as an access point. That day, Tanya took his phone and read the messages, which consisted of discussing intimate topics and illegal substances. Tristan was at school at the time and saw incoming messages on his phone. Shocked parents texted him in a family chat about the information they found in Tristan's phone. On the same day, Sherry King, an English teacher, called Tristan's mother complaining about his academic performance and behavior. Later at the trial, she will tell that Tanya Borlas called her back and informed her that she and her husband would soon arrive at school and pick up Tristan to discuss it with him. Sherry King told Tristan about it, and he was very surprised. His parents left the youngest child with his grandmother and went to high school. They drove home in silence. At the trial, Tristan will say that his mother was tense and frowned constantly, flipping through messages on his phone. At home, a conversation lasted about an hour and a half, after which Tanya sent a message to her mother telling her that Tristan was not upset about taking his phone and car keys until grades and behavior improved, and that she would soon come to pick up the youngest child. The message was sent at 4 p.m. After that, their conversation apparently continued. According to Tristan, he and his mother talked about studying, relationships with girls, and illegal substances. Tanya told him that she did not want him to study other religions besides Christianity. He was forced to listen to her and realized how many flaws he had. They even made a list of qualities that he should have in order to become a better person. Compassion, honesty, etc. 
The police will find this list later. At some point, according to Tristan, his mother came up to him from behind and wrapped her arms around his neck. He instinctively jumped up, turned around and accidentally hit her with his elbow. According to him, his mother had never done anything like this, and that's why he freaked out. His mother was scared, grabbed scissors from the shelf and moved towards her son. He was shocked and stabbed her with a knife, believing that he was defending himself and ran to his father for help. Later, a forensic examination will not find any evidence that his mother tried to strangle him. During the trial, the prosecution will show the photographs of Tanya Borlas's neck with a broken bone. The psychologist at the trial said that Tristan Borlas was mentally sane at the time, but was experiencing depersonalization and derealization. However, the court and the jury will not take that into account, considering Tristan as a manipulator and a dangerous person. According to Tristan's statement, he did not understand what was happening, why his father was running away from him and why he stabbed him, although he begged him for help. He remembered his father taking the stone and saying, Tristan, don't do this. But he was absolutely sure that his father would rather die than try to harm his son. Later, neighbors reported that at about 5.30 p.m. that Wednesday, they heard loud screams at the Borlas family's property. After that, Tristan returned home and vomited. According to the psychologist, this indicated the stress that Tristan had experienced. However, the jury disagreed with the psychologist's opinion. The autopsy report showed that Jeffrey Borlaz had multiple stab wounds to the left chest and back, cuts on arms and hands, and scratch marks on his skull and forehead. The autopsy report of Tanya Borlaz indicates that she was stabbed several times on the left chest, back, and arm, as well as had injuries that could have been sustained by compression of the neck. The results showed that the parents were defending themselves, not attacking Tristan. Besides, Tristan had a chance to run away from his mother, and even if he was mentally unstable and tried to defense himself, taking his father's life and further actions were suspicious because Tristan returned home, pulled out his mother's body and placed it in the truck, hiding it under a blanket. Then he cleaned the crime scene for about an hour and even used a hose to wash the porch. Around 8.30 p.m., Tristan arrived at his grandmother's to pick up his younger brother. Robin found it strange, but Tristan explained that his parents went to the store and did not have time. About 20 minutes later, Robin got a call from her other grandson who complained that their parents were not answering their phones and did not pick him up from his part-time job, as they usually did. Robin called Alexis and asked her to go get her brother. They agreed that they would meet at Jeffrey and Tanya's house and figure out what happened. As Robin drove up to the house, she noticed blood on the porch, but since the couple bred animals, it wasn't something unusual. She went into the house to get a flashlight to go check on the animals and saw blood everywhere. At that time, Alexis ran into the house and said that she found a body under a hammock near the animal shed and saw Tristan with blood on his face in a car driving away. Alexis called the emergency services. The operator told her to lock herself in the car with all the family members and wait for the police to arrive. The police arrived 10 minutes later. After several hours of waiting outside and talking to officers, they went to the station and were informed that Jeffrey and Tanya Borlaz had been found dead. During crime scene inspection, the detectives found a video surveillance system inside the house. They found the monitor broadcasting live video and requested an order to get the data from the service system company. Meanwhile, Tristan called his friend Evelyn and came to her house. She understood that he was worried about something and noticed several scratches on his forehead and hands. However, Tristan assured that he had an argument with his parents and got scratches playing with the dog. Evelyn recalled that Tristan had three scratches on his forehead, a wound on his arm, a cut on his finger, and a bruised nail. Immediately after the crime, Tristan posted a photo of his injuries on Snapchat, explaining that his father's dog hurt him. According to his girlfriend, the photo showed the exact injuries she saw on him that evening. Tristan stayed at Evelyn's house. The next morning, they went to Walmart and McDonald's and were going to go to school, but then changed their minds. 
Evelyn was convinced that Tristan just wanted to ran away from his parents, so she offered him to stay with one of her relatives for a while. He agreed, and they went to another state. On April 11th, Sheriff's Office gained access to the video surveillance system at the Borlas house. They looked at the footage and found out the details of the crime. The police got an arrest warrant for Tristan and found out the numbers of the car and began searching. Officer Matthew received information that Tristan had been seen in Tennessee. He asked Robin to go with him and talk. While driving in the car with Evelyn, Tristan noticed blue lights of police cars chasing them. He told his girlfriend that his parents probably told police that he stole the car. He was trying to break away, but in the end, stopped. His Ford was surrounded by police cars. Evelyn was shocked when she saw that her boyfriend was handcuffed and put in a police car. The officers noticed that Tristan did not look upset or worried. His interrogation on April 11, 2019, which was conducted by Officer Matthew, was recorded. The young man answered all the questions, plead guilty, and told all the details. He even cried at times. Tristan Borlas, who was a month away from his 18th birthday, was taken into custody without bail. Later, officers received a warrant to investigate Tristan's Snapchat account and his five phones, which could contain information about the crime. A search warrant was also obtained for a house on Orchard Road, where detectives found another phone, a keyboard and a safe handle, paper cups, a hammer, a straw, knives, a smear with red spots, glasses, a kitchen towel, a hammock, a DVR, a mat, various papers, South Dakota cards and shoes. A warrant was also obtained for a Ford F-150, where officers found a smear with red spots, a laptop, a charger, and a steering wheel cover. They also searched Tristan's girlfriend house in Boone as the young man spent the night with her. According to the reports, officers found a pillowcase, a zip-up hoodie, and a notebook. All of this helped investigators to reconstruct the chronology of events down to the smallest details. The version of Tristan's self-defense was considered untenable. Jeff and Tanya's funeral took place on April 17, 2019, at the Church of the Spiritual Bible Brotherhood. The ceremony was led by pastors William Krantz and Brad Gray. Children who experienced the loss of their parents at such an early age found the strength to write a touching obituary. Our parents never got the chance to live for themselves because they always lived for us. Jeff and Tanya's parents were proud of them. Our parents made the world a better place and we hope to continue their legacy by loving people and Jesus. After the funeral, Taylor visited her brother in prison for the first time and was shocked by his behavior. Tristan not only did not feel guilty, but also tried to blame his family for what happened. It seemed that he believed that sooner or later he would be released. Taylor was disgusted with her brother and left. She visited him again on May 11th because of Tristan's birthday. This time she came with Robin, but this meeting was the same as the previous one. Tristan was praising the party they gave him in prison. Taylor found this behavior unacceptable because their parents tragically died. After this visit, the family decided to cut off any contact with Tristan. The trial began on February 16th, 2022. At the trial, Tristan expressed regret for what had happened. He agreed with everything his family members said about him and supported the decision to permanently ban communication with his family so that they would be safe. On March 3rd, Tristan Borlas was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Judge Horn noted that Tristan's mental health was a mitigating factor, as the psychologist's report proves that Tristan Borlas continued to suffer from anxiety, depression, and has developed symptoms of post-traumatic stress. However, Judge Horn stated that the psychologist had found no evidence of psychotic disorders, although anxiety and depression could indeed be aggravated by the constant use of illegal substances. It is strange that neither Tristan's family, nor the lawyer, nor Tristan himself, explained the motives for the crime. He either did not fully understand what happened, or just pretended that he didn't. Bit on the other hand, he was a self-hating teenager with low self-esteem, prone to depression, actively showing symptoms of anxiety, and not receiving the necessary medical care. 
During the court, Tristan told about the panic attacks that his mother helped him to cope with, since she herself experienced them as well. One of the main statement of pietism says, Children aggravated by original sin are immoral from birth, and therefore education and school should correct them, preparing them for correct behavior in life by establishing strict discipline and suppressing children's self-awareness. Tristan, who may have had a hereditary mental illness, grew up within strict limits, constantly feeling like he wasn't enough. According to his older sister, Tristan was very jealous of his parents because of his new brothers. At first he had a riot, then was in a depressive state, feeling his own worthlessness, which were joined by illegal substances, panic attacks and depersonalization and derealization. He did not accept his parents' religiosity. He couldn't become the way his mother wanted him to be and felt the need to change himself. Was the list of necessary changes that they wrote together with his mother his last straw? And was it possible to avoid such a tragedy in a truly loving family?